Why don't we do this? Why don't we go ahead and pray this evening uh, before we jump into it, and then we can, we can begin. Heavenly Father, we once again, Lord, we come before you. And God, we thank you uh, again. Lord, I want to thank you again for your presence in this place. Lord, you are, so, you are so faithful. Thank you for what you are doing in our lives this day. Lord, just as we sing, Lord, you take us from glory to glory. You take us from faith to faith. Lord, our lives will never be the same. And so, Holy Spirit, thank you for your work in us today. Have your way. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in our hearts and in our lives. Speak to us. Lord, we've not come into the house of God to hear from a man, from the young, from the old. Uh, God, we've come to hear from you. And God, when you speak, Lord, it makes all the difference. Lord, so open up our hearts that we may receive. Open up our ears that we may hear. Father, do the work that you uh, so desperately desire to do in our hearts and our lives. And God, as we walk into the blessing of those things, we'll be careful to give you all of the praise, all of the honor, and all of the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody today said, amen, 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 amen. Man, you guys keep on playing that piano. I just want to start singing. The God who was in... All right, all right. Hey, tonight, if you're taking notes, um, I, I titled the message this fundamentals of faith. And I just want to talk to you tonight about some fundamentals of faith. And really, we're, we're going to be looking, we'll look at a few verses, but we're really going to be pulling our thoughts and our points from one verse tonight. And so um, you can jot down that title, fundamentals of faith. You know, it, it's, it's, I, I don't know, it's kind of interesting to me over the, the six or seven years that I've been pastoring, I just, I don't ever feel like I can come up with a good title. I think I've come up with three in the last seven years that I'm actually proud of. And I'm like, that's pretty creative. That's pretty cool. Uh, so, but it, so it is what it is. But, but I want to talk to you about some fundamentals of faith. And if you brought your Bibles, if you'll turn in them with me to Hebrews chapter 11, verse number six, and we'll read it together. And throughout the course of the night, we'll be, again, we'll be pulling our our, our thoughts, which we will put up on the screen, uh, from this verse. And it says this, it says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Just, just really an incredible verse and, and one that I really believe it, it will be an encouragement to you, has been an encouragement to me over the years. But let's just go ahead and jump right into it today. Uh, the first thing I notice here is that faith is a nece is necessary, I'm sorry, let me try that again. Faith is a necessary ingredient for pleasing God. Faith, one more time, is a necessary ingredient for pleasing God. Now let me just talk just for a moment about pleasing God. And, uh, you know, actually a moment ago I mentioned how they did that song, and it's just like, man, it's just that confirmation. Hey, I'm on the right track. I'm, I'm hearing God, and I'm going to speak what God wants me to speak tonight. Actually, this morning, if you're here this morning, Pastor Jim opened up his message talking about pleasing God. And, again, I was sitting there like, yes, amen. I Thank you, God, for just confirming that I'm on the right track and I'm speaking the right things. But I, And so I just want to kind of second uh, his sentiment this morning a little bit and say this to you, that as believers, if you're born again today, if you're a Christian, in love with Jesus, following Jesus, I believe in, inside each and every one of our hearts is this desire to please God. And at the very least, it should be. It ought to be. We, we should have this desire on the inside of us to be well-pleasing in his sight. You know, I don't know about you, but I, I've, I've thought a little bit about, you know, what the Bible has to say about my position before I came to know Jesus Christ. And the Bible is very clear that before I came to know Jesus, while I was lost in my sin, that actually I was at enmity with God. I was actually in opposition to God. You'll even find words as strong as, you know what, you were a, a son of the devil. You were a child of the devil. You, you, you were in opposition to who God was. Uh, but then it comes along and says, but God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love which he has towards us, even when we're in that position and in that state, he made us alive together with Jesus Christ. We've been brought out of a position of enmity, brought out of a position of opposition, and we've been brought in brought into a place of reconciliation. Is anybody here thankful that you have been reconciled to God? And now no longer is there this, you know, this gap between you and God because of the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so as a result, I, I step back and I say, you know what, God, there was once a time in my life where I was not pleasing. There was once at a time in my life where I was in opposition and I was doing the wrong thing and I was, you know, an enemy of God, fighting against God. But now because of Jesus Christ, because I've come to know the way, the truth, and the life, God, now I want to be well-pleasing in your sight. 
I want to be pleasing to you. And it really should be within our, you know, one of the, one of the goals, one of the endeavors of our lives to be pleasing to God. Now, can I just say this to all of you, that pleasing God is not a given. Pleasing God is not a given. And I think sometimes as, as Christians and believers, especially here in the United States of America, well, God bless this country, I love this country, but we sometimes come to the conclusion that God's pleasure with us is a given because of Jesus Christ. Now let me say this. God's love for you and for me is a given. God has always loved you. He will always love you. Even, even after this life is over, should you end up in hell, God forbid, he will still love you for the rest of eternity. God's love is unconditional. God loves you as much as he's ever going to love you. There's nothing that you can do to get God to love you more, praise the Lord, and there's nothing that you can do to get God to love you less. Is anybody here thankful for the love of God? Okay, but God's love and God's pleasure are really two different things. You know, I love my children. My, my son is seven, my daughter is five, and they are precious in my sight. I just, I just love them. They, every time I see them, I think, ooh, nobody else can make as good-looking kids as me and my wife. <laughs> of course, every parent thinks that of their children, right? And, and, and I just love them, okay? And, and, and nothing will ever change that. But that doesn't mean that daddy is always pleased with the decision that's, decisions that they make. Sometimes they break daddy's heart. Sometimes they make daddy's heart sad. Sometimes they frustrate me. How many of you know the Bible talks about that we can, we can grieve the spirit of God and we can frustrate him. Now, no need to get under condemnation today because we've all been there, all right? And uh, some of us have grieved God a little more than others, but, but we're all in the same boat, okay? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Okay, but, but you understand, you know, uh, again, we, we, we need to endeavor to be pleasing to God. And can I just say this, that when you come to a place where you, where you begin to sense God's pleasure in your life, it is one of the most fulfilling, one of the most wonderful and satisfying things you will ever experience in your life, to know that God is pleased with you. You know, I think of Jesus, and Jesus was baptized, right? He comes to John the Baptist, and Jesus is baptized, and he goes under the water, and he comes back up, and the Holy Spirit descends like a dove, right, right? Everybody knows this story, right? And the Bible says, and a voice comes from heaven and says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And I want you to know tonight, God's pleasure is not reserved for Jesus alone. God's pleasure belongs to God's children who are walking and living in the ways of God. Amen? And so just real quick, by, by raising of your hand, how many of you here want to be pleasing to God? Amen. Good. Then, 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 then I'm talking to the right people, okay? But here's the catch. It says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. It takes faith to enter into this category where we are pleasing to God. It's a, it's a necessary ingredient, Okay. Oh, okay. So, all right, Pastor Joe, like I want to be pleasing to God, but, and, and I realize now that it takes faith. So then what is faith? What is faith tonight? All right. Here's what faith is. I'm going to give you a few definitions tonight. Uh, Vines, Strong's, your, your popular concordances will define it this way. Faith is a persuasion. Faith is a firm persuasion. Faith is a conviction the word faith, you could, you, you could define it this way, to believe. Okay, one more time. Faith, what is faith? All right, if, if it's impossible to please God without faith, then, then what is faith? Faith is a persuasion, a firm persuasion, a conviction. Faith is to believe. All right, simply what you believe tonight. That's what faith is. Now, now I, I like these definitions because they, they begin to uh, describe for us you know, as it relates to Hebrews eleven six, 6, what God is actually looking for in our lives, okay? God is looking for a people who are persuaded about some things. God is looking for a people who have some conviction about them. God is looking for a people tonight who believe the word of the Lord and take God at his promise. God is looking for some faith-filled, faith, you know, believing, conviction people to, to carry out his plan and his will on the earth. That's what God is looking for. No wonder, right? No wonder faith is required to be pleasing to God. So, so, so one of the questions I thought would be cool to ask tonight is, what do you believe tonight, church? What do you believe about God tonight? 
What I mean, I mean, Christianese aside, right answers aside, what do you really believe? When the rubber meets the road, when you get down to the nitty and the gritty, what has been really built on the inside of you that you really believe about God that is strong enough in your heart to support action? What do you really believe? Because God is looking for people who are people of conviction and a people of faith. I just want to take a moment to declare a few things that I believe tonight. I believe that by his stripes I am healed. I believe that my God shall supply all of my need and your need according to his riches and glory. I believe that my God is El Shaddai. He is almighty God. And there is nothing that he can't do. His ear is not heavy that he cannot hear. His arm is not shortened that he cannot save. He can make a way where there seems to be no way. I believe some things about my God. I believe he's the resurrected Lord. I believe one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess and everybody declare that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. I have some beliefs in my life about the Lord Jesus Christ and I believe that you do too. And and these are the kinds of things that, that God is looking for in each and every one of our lives. Conviction, persuasion, just like we were singing tonight. Do you believe tonight that he is the miracle worker? Maybe you're in a position in your life where, you know what, people have said your situation is an impossible situation. There's no getting out. There's no fixing. I've got good news for you. My Bible says that he is a miracle worker, and he can do what no other power can do. And what is impossible with man is possible with God. I love so much the words of of King David in Psalms 23, verse number 13, if we could pop it up on the screen here. But he makes a statement. He said, I would have lost heart. Unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Paul, I'm sorry, David believed some things about Jesus Christ. And actually, the context of this verse is his son had just tried to take the throne from him. His son had just, I mean, your own family, right? The ones closest to you have come along now. They're going to overthrow him. Can you imagine? And then his son dies. Can you imagine the kind of heartache and the kind of grief? The kind of pressure that he was under. I would have lost heart except I had some faith in my life. I had a belief about God. And that belief was that he is good and he's going to turn this around. And I'm going to see his goodness in the land of the living. Now, in the land of the living, we don't talk like that today. But what he's simply saying is not, God's not going to be good to me in the sweet by and by. God's not going to be good to me when I get to heaven. God's going to be good to me this day, this hour, this side of heaven. I wonder, is there anybody in here tonight who believes that this is the day of salvation? That this is the year of the Lord? This is the day for God's favor upon your life. Come on, somebody. This is the day for your children to come home to Jesus. This is the day for your body to be healed. This is the day of restoration of marriages. This is the day of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, where young men will see visions and old men will dream dreams. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, oh, I wish I had somebody up in this place to help Help me out tonight. Where's my choir? <laughs> Pastor Jess, when Pastor Dan gets back, maybe we can propose getting an organ player because sometimes a preacher need a little help up here. <laughs> but what do you believe? Okay? It takes faith. It takes persuasion. It takes conviction. And it takes a believing heart. No wonder why we can't be pleasing to God without faith. Your life will not follow through with God's promises without it. Let me say that again. Your life, my life, will not follow through with God's promises without it. Wait a second, Pastor Joe. I thought it was God's responsibility to follow through with his promises. It is. And he's faithful to perform his word, the Bible says. Okay? But how many realize that we have a part to play? And, and, and we have to live our, our lives in such a way that we see his promises through. You know, I, I imagine it like a football player, like a quarterback, right? The quarterback, he's told the wide receiver, that would be you. The, the quarterback would be Jesus, all right? And he's told, he's told us the route that we need to run. I, I know this is a sports analogy, so ladies, hang on for a second. I'm sure we'll, we'll get to you at some point in time in the message, all right? But no, I'm just kidding. Okay, and, and, and he says, hike! And if you know anything about football, that runner already knows the route he's supposed to run. So, that, so at a moment's notice, that quarterback can throw that football in, the, in, that, in that destination that the, that the uh, receiver is supposed to, 
to end up at, and they catch it, and they go, and they score a touchdown, right? And, and I see the quarterback as Jesus and us as the wide receiver, and he says, hike, and he turns, and he throws. They're not there. They're still sitting on the line. They're on the, in fact, some of us are on the sideline. See, we have to, we have to, faith allows us to follow through with God's promises. Faith does. Okay? Hebrews gives us a long list of people who accomplish great things. Right? We're, we're reading Hebrews 11.6, right? Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. And on Hebrews chapter 11 goes, and it talks about, you know, the great men and women of old. It talks about Noah and Moses and, you know, all these individuals who did great things and saw God do great things in their lives. And, and it tells you the ingredient that they have by which God was able to accomplish those things. It says, by faith, by faith, Noah, by faith, Moses, by faith, right, right? And so we realize that it takes faith to follow through with God's promises. Let me, let me see if I can break this down for you a little bit more. Do you think that Noah would have built an ark if he didn't believe God? He wouldn't have. If Noah did not believe God, he would have been like everybody else. What's an ark? Rain, what is rain? But he believed God, and he and his family were saved. Of course, we know from reading the rest of Scripture that really salvation was offered to anybody else who believed, but nobody else believed. Do you think that Moses would have, would have approached Pharaoh and challenged Pharaoh if he didn't believe God? No, no, it, it took faith to leave the desert and go to Egypt and confront Pharaoh and try to, you know, turn the hearts of, of this, you know, group of a million people or more. To follow God where he wanted to lead. How about Sarah? I told you I get to the ladies at some point. Sarah. All right? Sarah in her old age, 90, 100 years old, God says, you're going to have a baby. How is that possible? Do you think that she would have had that baby if she didn't believe God? No. It took, it, it took faith. It took believing God. Actually, it was very interesting about Sarah's story. is the first time, first couple of times that God came and told her that she was going to have a baby. She laughed. She was like, <laughs> that's a good one, God. You should have been at the Rock Church last weekend because you, you would have been a good part of them dad jokes. Because I'm 90, I'm 100, I ain't having no baby. She knew her mom. She knew her grandmother before her. She knew her friends. She knew how, you know, the progression of a woman's life. When, and how many ladies can testify, when you get 90 years old, you can't have a baby and neither do you want to have a baby. Amen? But if you read on to verse number 11, it says that she had this moment of revelation. And it says, and when she judged God faithful, she, she, had, she gained the faith to believe God and conceive that baby, Isaac, right? When she judged God faithful, she took a look at God's track record. Maybe that's a word for us today. Maybe some of us, if we're struggling in our faith walk, maybe it's time for us to take a time out and look at God's track record and look at how faithful he's been in our life. I, I find another man by the name of, of, of David, and he shows up to the battlefield, and all the rest of the Israelites are cowering at Goliath. And he says, no, uh, uh uh the same God who delivered me from the bear and the same God who delivered me from the lion will be the same God who delivers me from this giant, from this uncircumcised Philistine. We, maybe we should take some time out from time to time and recount how faithful God has been. I believe that we'll begin to gain strength for dealing with today's issues as well as our future. And that's what Sarah did. But, but my point is, is that it takes faith. It takes faith to follow through with God's promises. All right, Pastor Joey, all right, I see you're, you're making this case for faith, okay? All right, I can't please God without it. I needed to follow through with God's promises. I mean, all these people did so many wonderful things. with. It. So, so I know what faith is now. It's a belief. How do I get it? I'm glad you asked. Faith comes from the word of God. How do I get faith? Where does faith come from? It comes from the word of God. Let's go to Romans chapter 10, verse number 17. Romans chapter 10, verse number 17. Familiar passage, probably one that many of us in here could quote. It's good, however, to go back and read it. Let's 
kind of funny because there's some verses I can quote and just something about opening up the Bible and actually reading, I were like, oh, I forgot. <laughs> right? All right. Hebrew, I'm sorry, what I say? Romans 10, 17. It says, so then, faith comes by hearing, okay, and hearing by the word of God. That's how faith comes. Faith comes from the word of God. Uh, let me put it to you like this. Faith comes from putting yourself in an environment where you can hear the word of God. That's how faith comes. You know, I, I know people out there, God bless them, right? And, uh, and look, so please don't ever take me wrong. I don't ever say the things that I say to put people down. Sometimes I, I say some things I realize later, oh, that was kind of rude. I don't know if anybody else has been there. Don't raise your hand, all right? But, um, you know, I know some people bless their heart. They're going to the movie theater trying to, trying to you know, conjure up faith in their life. The movie theater, God spoke to me in this movie. Great! How did that help you? Right? Listening to their music, listening to politicians. I have faith in God again. Why? Because Donald Trump got elected. Because President Obama got elected. Let me just play both sides so you guys don't get the wrong impression here. We're not talking about politics. We're talking about all the things that we run to in order to conjure up faith. All the while, it's in the word of God. It comes from the word of God and putting myself in an environment where God can speak to me. Okay, what, what, do, what, do, those, what do those look like? tonight, all right? Reading God's word is an environment under which you can gain faith. Reading, taking your Bible home, dusting, the, you know, dusting it off, opening it up and saying, God, speak to me, and then reading it. That's an environment where your faith will grow. How about coming to church? Now, thank God, I'm talking to the right people tonight because all y'all came to church here in the right place. Tonight, we're not talking to you. We're talking to all the people who stayed home, okay? All right, all right. So thank God you came. Thank God you came today. Church is a place where your faith can, you can develop faith in church, where, where the word of God is being preached and you come with an attentive ear, right? right? Don't think just because you're in the building that your faith is going to grow and you're texting the whole time and playing video games the whole time and you're nodding off and making jokes with your friends. Oh, yeah, this is not youth. This is adults. I forgot. But you understand, Jesus said, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. And if you come with an ear to hear and the word of God is going forth, your faith's going to grow. And, 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 and listen, you, you almost don't even have to try. All you got to do is pay attention. It's really kind of cool how God's word is able to build faith into your life. How about this? I believe in making faith confessions. Speaking the word of God over my life. It builds my faith. It helps me. You and I need, I, I know it's awkward to talk to yourself, y'all. I know it's weird, all right? All right? I've, there's been a couple times I've been in my car talking to myself, speaking the word of God. I look over and the people are just looking at me like, and then, and then I lie. It's the Bluetooth. Bluetooth um, no. <laughs> right? But speaking the word of God. You know, just today I, I had to practice what I'm preaching. It's not easy to get up in front of people and, and, and talk. It's not easy to be up here. I, I know I might be, you know, uh, you know, lots of energy and, and whatnot, and I seem like a natural, but it's not easy. I'm freaking out every time I have to do it. In fact, every time I'm thinking of what's my best excuse to tell Pastor Dan, I can't do it tonight. He's, he's the senior pastor, and he's going to have to do it because that's his role, right? Because it's not easy, and I had to stand back today and say, you know what? You know what? I remember a man by the name of Paul talking to a young minister by the name of Timothy as it relates to his ministry and saying, Timothy, don't be afraid. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So God, I thank you right now that you've given me, you know, the spirit of, of power and of love and of a sound mind. In fact, I take it to make it even more personal. I am a spirit of God's love. I am a spirit of God's power. And I am a spirit of soundness of mind that comes from God. And all of a sudden I have the faith and the ability to get up and do what God's called me to do. How about you? Right? Speaking God's word over our, over our lives. Uh, there's another couple of other ones that I like. You know, like, I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away. All things have become new. And all these things are of God who has reconciled me unto himself. Uh, another one of my favorites, favorites Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Jesus lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You have no idea how your faith will grow when you begin to speak God's word over your life. I am more than a conqueror 
through Jesus Christ. I thought it'd be cool we practice today. So everybody stand to your feet. Get your Bible. And I'm going to lead you. All right, in just some, in, in, in some faith confessions tonight, just, just, just a couple, all right? Now, now, listen, you got to participate, okay? And you've got to say this like you believe it, okay? You got your Bible in hand, all right? All right, tonight, get your Bible and say, this is my Bible. It is the Word of God. It is the Word of God to me. It is infallible. It is incorruptible. And I can base my life on it. I am what the Bible says I am. I can do what the Bible says I can do. I can have what the Bible says I can have. I am more than a conqueror in Jesus Christ. Anybody feel a little bit better today? All right, you can sit back down. You can sit back down. Speaking God's word over your life. You see, there's power in the word of God. How does it give you faith? Because it's powerful. It makes known to you and I what we don't already know. How many realize, don't raise your hand, but how many realize you don't know everything that you ought to know? Neither do I. There's more learning. There's more growing to do in the, in the things of God. And God's word will tell you what you don't already know. How can you have faith about something that you have, you have no knowledge about? It's an impossibility. God's word reminds us of things that we have forgotten. Isn't that one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit, to remind us of the things that Jesus has said to us? Right? That's God's word. God's word will break down every doubt. God's word will dissolve every fear. God's word can do the work in you that no other power can do. It is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the vision of soul and spirit, of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's got everything that you need right where you're at. At your own personal age and situations, God work, God's work can help the white man. God's work can help the black man. God's work can help the Hispanic man. God's work can help the Asian man, the Samoa. Come on, somebody. It doesn't matter where you're, where you're at in your life, what experience you've had. Who did you wrong? Well, you just don't know what they did to me. God's word can set it right in your heart and in your life. James, I love what James says, James 1.21 it says, receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. My friend, that's not talking about salvation. James is talking to Christians who are already saved there. He's talking about a renewing of the mind. God's word has the power to renew your mind, to fix your soul, to salvage what, you know, the world has brought, you know, destruction to. I don't know if you've been there, but, you know, the, the pressures and the weights of the world, the skepticisms and the criticisms and the comments and the beliefs and the, and, and the problems and, every, and the vomit of the world can, can put a th soul through the mud. But all of a sudden, God's, the washing of the water of the word of God comes along and cleans all that stuff, wipes you up, stands you back up, gets you on your feet, puts your feet on solid ground and gets you on your way. The word of God. So we have to put ourselves in an environment of the word of God in order for faith to grow in our hearts and in our lives, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Let me just say one more thing about the word of God. It helps you believe God for the right things. It'll keep you honest and help you believe God for things that he endorses instead of wasting our time believing God for things that he does not endorse. I remember a story Pastor Jim told, has told over the years of a woman who met him at the back door as he was greeting people as they were exiting the sanctuary. Pastor Jim, see that man over there? That's my husband. Pastor Jim looked over it, said, oh, that man is already married, but the Lord said, that's my husband. You see, if you get around God's word, God's word's not going to let you believe God for things that he does not endorse. Um, let, me, let, me, let me break it down, make it a little bit more personal. Some of you single people in here, you're praying and asking God, oh, please let my coworker, let him fall in love with me. Let my, let, let, oh, I think this, is, and they're not even saved. God does not endorse that. God is not trying to help you out with that situation. But if you'll step back and say, God, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to believe you and I'm going to wait for the right one, God will be faithful to you and he'll perfect that which concerns you. And bring the right person along. And so the word of God helps us stay on track. It keeps us honest so we don't waste our time believing God for things that, he was, that he's not going to support. 
Putting ourselves in an environment of God's word will build faith in our lives, okay? Now, as we read Hebrews eleven six, 6, let's go back there. I know you're in Romans right now. Let's go back to Hebrews 11, verse number 6. And we've got here, um, as, we, as we read further, we see a couple of beliefs that um, the scripture gives to us to help us maximize our interactions with God, okay? Everybody follow that? Let me say that one more time. As we read f- further, we're going to find two beliefs that, that God gives to us that will help us maximize uh, our interactions with God, or you might say our faith interactions with God, okay? You, you might even say even our transactions with God. Here's two beliefs that are going to help you and help me maximize. So notice what it says. Without faith is impossible to please him, right? For he who comes to God, watch this, must believe that he is. That's the first one. The next one is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Okay, now let's go back to the first one, okay? He who comes to God must believe that he is. Some of your translations say must believe that he exists. I think there might be one or two that say must believe that he is God, okay? Now let me say this about this this word is or he is or he exists or even he is God. I, I think they're a little bit vague to be honest with you. You understand that the New Testament was originally written in Greek and has been translated into English, okay? And, and if you really study out this word, he is, or he exists, okay, I, 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 again, I think it's a little, a little vague at what the writer is trying to articulate and communicate to you and I. Because he is, or he exists, carries with it this idea of that he is, or he exists, on hand. That he is, let me say that one more time, on hand. In other words, that he is not just out there in the cosmos, out there in the skies somewhere, right? How many of you know that people believe in God, but they don't believe in the right God? So we're talking about more than just believing that God exists. It, 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 carries, with this, it carries with it this idea that God is on hand. I like to put it this way, that God is what you need him to be in that given situation or in that given moment. He who comes to God must believe that he is on hand, that he is what you need him to be in that given moment or situation. How many of you know, um, let me just read this to you real quick. It's in Psalms. Psalms 46.1, we'll just put it up real quick. Notice what the psalmist says. God is our refuge and strength. Notice what he says here. A very present help in trouble. Does that sound to you like having a belief or faith that God is on hand, that God is what he needs him to be in that given situation, moment? Okay, let me give you some examples. There are Christians today, and again, we're not talking down on anybody. We're not, we don't think of ourselves better than anybody else. There are Christians today who do not believe that Jesus is the healer. He was the healer. One day he'll heal again when we get to heaven, but today he's not the healer anymore. And as a result, they are not going to God when they get sick. He who comes to God must believe that he is on that he is what you need him to be. How many of you know there are Christians, again, not talking down on anybody, who don't believe that Jesus is any longer the baptizer in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues? Oh, he was. He did it to a few people every, you know, every once in a blue moon. Or, or how many of you heard that? Maybe you've heard this one. Um, I'll, I'll have it if God wants me to have it. See, they don't believe that He is the baptizer, and because they don't have that faith, they are not approaching God to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay, and, and I, I know those are like you know, uh, maybe those are not topics as you know where you're at today. But maybe today you 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 need to know Jesus as a healer. Maybe today you need to know Him as a provider. Maybe today you need to develop or let God's word develop more faith in you that He is a Father. That He is, you know, that He is that He is God. That He is Lord. Okay, and as as we again get into God's word, God's word will show us the character of God. And reveal to us who he is. So that we can believe uh, that he is what we need him to be. Okay? So so he who comes to God. So if you're going to go to God about something, you need to believe that he is what you need him to be. Okay? The second thing here 
is this that, and, and this is really uh, kind of our final thought tonight, all right? The last thing, or, or the second thing here, is that he is a rewarder, all right? One more time, Hebrews eleven six. it says, and we'll just skip down to the, the latter half. It says, he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Okay, God is a rewarder. In other words, you're, you, you will not uh, pursue God in vain. You will not seek God in vain. He is a rewarder. Or, or, in other words, he is not a withholder. He is, and, and this is this is how I kind of want to put it for you today, so we, this, is, this is the last point. He is a giver. God is not a withholder. My God, he is a giver. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. No wonder, no wonder he comes along and says, whoever asks receives. And whoever seeks finds. And then who knocks, the door will be open. How could you say that if you weren't generous? How could you say that if you weren't a giver? if you weren't a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Listen, you will not go to God in faith and in cooperation or in accordance with God's word and ever get denied. He, he's a giver. Now, I, you say, Pastor Joe, I, I've done this before. I've had faith and I did according to the word of God. I don't, okay, 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 okay. I, I don't know your personal situation. Okay, but, but my Bible says that God is faithful. Maybe it's a time thing. Maybe God is like, yes, but this is the right time for that. I, 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 I don't know. Or, or, or maybe today you started off in faith, but you didn't keep in faith long enough to receive the promise. Right? So my, my point is that tonight is that we need to realize that God is, that he's a giver. He is not a withholder. He's not somebody who keeps back. Um, from giving to those who come to him. Let me just give you a f few pieces of evidence. James 1.5, all right? James 1.5, let's we'll throw it up here on the, on the screen, okay? If any of you lacks wisdom, James is talking about wisdom, but he takes a time out to tell us something about God. If, anybody, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Time out, let me tell you something about him. Who gives to all liberally and without reproach, or in other words, without fault finding. God's not trying to find reasons why he doesn't have to give to you. So let's call the devil a liar, tell him to shut up, and let's get into faith and believe God. Okay? He takes a time out to tell us something about God's character. Hey, he gives to all liberally. If I tell you to go ask, you know, hey, this is, this is Reverend Joe right here, right? If you need some bubble gum, go ask Reverend Joe. You're like, I don't know Reverend Joe. I'm not going to go ask him. No, 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 okay. Let me take a time out and tell you a little bit about him. He always has bubble gum, and he loves to give gum to anybody who asks. That's what James is doing here. He's, telling, he's talking about the character of God, okay? And he gives to all liberally. How about this one? 1 Timothy 6, 17. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Notice, he's liberally giving and he's richly giving. That's who God is. Okay, my last piece of evidence, and I think this is the, the, the best one. All right, save the best for last. Romans 8, 32. God, it says he, but speaking of God, God who did not spare his own son. Spare means to withhold. It means to hold back. I'm, I'm going to save Jesus from the pain that, 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 you're, that, that sin is asking him to bear. It says that God did not do that. With Jesus. He did not spare his son. On the contrary, the opposite, he delivered him up. How many realize today ain't nobody taking Jesus without God's permission? And ain't nobody taking Jesus without Jesus' permission. Jesus says, Nobody takes my life. I lay it down. I got to lay the thing down, baby, because you just can't, you can't take it from me. You wish, but you can't. So I'm gonna have to lay it down for you. Right? Okay? He did, he, did not, he did not spare him, but he delivered him up for us all. And watch, watch the conclusion that God thinks that we should come to as a result of what God did. How shall he not, with Jesus, also freely give us all things? Somebody once said it this way, if he gave you the best, he'll give you the rest. 
Come on, if he gave you his best, if Jesus, and you know Jesus is the best, he's going to give you the rest. You're not going to go to Jesus. Here he offered up his son, and you're going to come to him and, and ask for healing? No. No. It doesn't make any sense. God, I, I need you to really provide for me in this area of your life. No, I'm not going to do it. No, 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 no. I gave my son for you. Of course I'm going to give you, you know, the riches of the kingdom. So we see that God is liberally giving, richly giving, and freely giving. Okay? In conclusion tonight, what do we learn? We learned that it's the faith, th these are faith fundamentals. Faith is a necessary ingredient for pleasing God. It takes faith to follow through with God's promises. How do I get faith? It comes from the word of God. I know I'm going through these quickly. We're out of time. Okay, we need to believe that God is on hand, and we need to believe that God is a giver. If you got something good from God's word, come on, give Jesus a great big praise this evening. <laughs>